So we're continuing on in the second book. The Pilgrim Continues His Way. And uh, we're on page 123 in my book. And last week, if you remember, he met a soldier along the way on his pilgrimage who had uh, been quite naughty, apparently, and um, uh, who had a companion who passed away. And he stole his companion's passport off the dead body. So it really wasn't. I don't know, maybe it was an inheritance instead of a theft. But anyway, he takes it and uh, takes his money as well and burns through that. And anyway, went through a very difficult time and now has sort of redeemed himself. And he was telling his whole story to our pilgrim. And now the pilgrim is getting ready to, uh, to respond. And he says, when I heard all of this, I was astonished. And I praised the wisdom and the goodness of God as I saw the different ways in which they were brought to sinners. So I said to him, dear brother, during the time of that fear and agony, you ought to have prayed to God. That is the great cure for all of our troubles. Not on your life, he said to me. <laughs> That's surprising. I thought that I, I thought that directly I began to pray to God it would that if I began to pray, God would destroy me. Nonsense, brother. It is the devil who puts thoughts like that into your head. There is no end to God's mercy, and he is sorry for sinners and quickly forgives all who repent. Perhaps you don't know the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. You go on saying that without stopping. Why, of course I know that prayer. I used to say it sometimes to keep my courage up when I was going to do a robbery. <laughs> Actually, I'm kind of happy to see that. <laughs> because I think that that's a beautiful and healthy uh, way to approach the divine. Uh, and that's also a story, you know, in India also, they have those dacoits that, wash, that, that worship Mother Kali, you know, Kali of the dacoits. And uh, used to, I, I don't know, the story was they used to make human sacrifice to her. But uh, I, anyway, I was just thrilled to, to see, uh, I don't know, a, a very different perspective of the breadth of the heart of the divine. You know, that, that uh, he can be worshipped, she can be worshipped uh, by, by everybody, <laughs> literally everybody. So I, I like that, and I encourage that, and I think it's beautiful. If that's where you are, and that's who you are, and that's what's going on in your life, at least at least bring the mother into your heart there. That's where, that's where change begins. That's where transcendence starts. And so irregardless of our conditions and our circumstances, in truth, they have nothing to do with us. We are that divine image deep within this covering, within this body. And so whatever it takes, whatever courage you can muster, always go to the divine. And I like what he says here, too, that it's, it's the devil in, in Christianity. It's ego uh, in Vedanta, uh, that, that the ego is what scares us away from going to the divine or uh, uh, accuses us. One of the names of Satan, actually, in the Bible is the accuser. And so when you find in your mind, you hear your mind accusing you or making you feel like you're unworthy or that you haven't repented properly and you can't go before God, uh, that, that that is not a holy voice. That is not a truth being spoken. That is the accuser, uh, you know, Satan or the ego trying to uh, keep you from destroying it <laughs> because that's ultimately ultimately what happens to the poor ego uh, in the light of the divine it melts very much like the witch in uh in uh well what's the name of that wizard of oz <laughs> when the water gets poured on her she melts away and so when you pour the divine name into the heart you know the accuser melts away the ego melts away I used to say it sometimes to keep my courage up when I was going to do a robbery. Now look here. God did not destroy you when you were on your way to do something wrong and said the prayer. Will he do something when you start praying on the path of repentance? Now, you see how your thoughts come from the devil. Believe me, dear brother, 
If you will say that prayer, taking no notice of whatever thoughts come into your mind, then you will quickly feel relief. All right, so here he's giving a little bit of instruction tucked tucked here into the story, and it's a good it's good instruction. Taking no notice of whatever thoughts come into your mind, then you will quickly feel relief. All the fear and strain will go go, and in the end, you will be completely at peace. You will become a devout man, and all sinful passions will leave you. I assure you of this, for I have seen a great deal of it in my time. This is a resounding theme in my last week, this last week. Almost everything that I've read this week has brought brought me to the name of God as being the, the one-stop solution to all of our troubles. You know, that, that this chanting of the name of the Beloved, uh, will take care of all the things that that you've got troubles with in your your life in the sense that it helps you to reach that calming point it helps you to reach that inner shrine that inner silence that oasis that we take refuge in uh, constantly uh, from from the the ups and downs in and outs of this world and so it's a wonderful teaching here that that when you're sitting there doing your mantra, chanting the name of God, have, don't pay any attention to any other thought that enters the mind. You sit there chanting in the company of the divine, the beloved. And th the reason that it's so powerful is, of course, the name invokes God, invokes the presence. But it's also that powerful because that presence is not only the presence of God, but it's your divine nature. And when your own nature is being... Uh, you know, you know, when you take a tuning fork, you hold it next to a string on a guitar or you pluck one string on a guitar, all the others will vibrate uh, along with that string. It's like that, you know, since our nature is divine and since the very heart of ourself is an image of the beloved, chanting the name of God is like plucking that single guitar string and the rest of you resonates in harmony with that. And, uh, and ultimately, this is like, uh, Hafiz says, it's like pouring your mind through a cheesecloth each time you repeat the divine name. It just filters out a little bit more of the me and mine, the selfishness, the, the self-centeredness uh, that we all experience um, by nature of the ego. And so just chanting that name will purify you inside. And then you don't have to go change the individual behaviors. You know, quite often we're told, oh, now be nice. And so you have to focus on being nice. And don't you hate your brother anymore. So then you have to focus on not beating your brother anymore. You know, or share your food. Oh, no, okay, okay. Now I have to remember not to beat my brother, to be nice and to, to share my food. You see, and we go along and we attack our life like that. That's, that's, uh, that's a, you know, not, a, not a, an efficacious way, not an effective way of taking care of the problem. Because the problem is ignorance at the root. It's not knowing what you are by nature. Uh, you've been lied to by the mind for so long. You've taken up such habits that are completely unbecoming to your nature. And to remind yourself of your nature, to, to reverberate with that name of the beloved, your nature, will bring you back in tune. And when you're in tune, you naturally share your food. You naturally don't beat your brother. <laughs> you naturally don't cuss. You naturally don't get angry. All of these things get taken care of because you finally know who you are. And you know what to express and how to express because you are a manifestation of that one. And so over and over and over again this week, in all the different little passages and stuff that I've been digging in or poking at, Mother has really got a message this week. And that is the divine name will do everything that you need. Will change you as you need to be changed or, or help you to transcend in the way that you want to transcend. But be earnest and sincere. Repeat that name as often as you can. You know, Holy Mother would be happy if you did it all day long, continuously. And uh, after you've started it for a while, as you know, many of you, that uh, it doesn't become an effort. The name goes of its own accord within the mind. And that's quite natural also. And so it's not like you can't do anything else while you're chanting the name of God. You can carry on conversations. You can talk to the mailman. You can, you know, deliver pizza, whatever you need to do while chanting the mother's name. 
and it turns all of those things into a blissful experience if you if you do it with sincerity and earnestness for a long enough time there's a period of time there where where the there's so much grease or so much gunk in the gears that have to be cleaned out that it might be a week or two before you begin to experience any sense of inner bliss but it's a promise that you will feel it he even says it here he says what did he say he says uh, uh he gives a whole list here. If you will say that prayer, taking no notice of whatever thoughts come into your mind, then you will quickly feel relief, all right? There'll be a sense of relief, a sense of rest. All the fear and strain will go, so your fear and strain will disappear, because God is fundamental. God is everywhere present, always perfect. There is no danger in the presence. All fear and strain will go, and in the end, you will be completely at peace. This peace that transcends understanding is your divine nature. And whenever we say something's our divine nature, don't, don't let your mind put that over here like, oh yeah, that. It's not over there, it's here. Your divine nature is, is you. It's your, you, the condition of your very self. You know, so your divine nature will be, is, is peace. Your divine right, your divine nature is bliss. And so these things will come to the surface uh, and become part of your experience. The quieter your mind becomes, uh, the more, the less distracted you become uh, by the world of change, the world of the senses. You will become a devout man. Uh, that probably means you'll be a devout woman if you're a woman. I don't I don't think all of us become devout men. <laughs> but you'll become a devout man. And uh, all of your passions, all of your sinful, all of your unhelpful passions. Uh, you know, I like to avoid that word sin. Sinful really, sin is just anything that's unhelpful uh, to your realization, to your, to your fulfilling of life. So sin is really just a stand-in word for meaning anything that's unhelpful or contrary to your ideal. To, to you reaching and expressing God in yourself perfectly. So all of these passions will leave you uh, because you'll find something that actually delivers uh, the joy you're looking for, you know, a joy that's not temporary, a joy that doesn't need to be constantly renewed, you know, a joy that's just constantly present and, and always with you and always accessible to you. At any time during the day, you can just sit down somewhere quiet, take a couple of deep breaths, chant the name, and in, and just assume the presence and, and find that sense of bliss, find that sense of peace, that sense of calmness that's native to you. And in time, you'll be established in it. So he says, I assure you of this, for I've seen a great deal of it in my time. Okay. After that, I told him about several cases in which the Jesus prayer had shown its wonderful power to work upon sinful people. In the end, I persuaded him to come with me to the Pokchov Mother of God, the refuge of sinners, before he went home, and to make his confession and communion there. My soldier listened to all of this attentively, and, as I could see, with joy, and he agreed to everything. We went to the Pokchev together on this, on this condition, that neither of us should speak to the other, but that we should say the Jesus prayer all the time. In this silence, we walked for a whole day. Next day, he told me that he felt much easier and that it was plain in his mind that his mind was calmer than before. On the third day, we arrived at Pokchev. And I urged him again not to break off the prayer, either day or night, while he was awake, and assured him that the most holy name of Jesus, which is unbearable to our spiritual foes, would be strong to save him. All right, I just looked up to let someone in and completely lost my place. Would be strong to save him. On this point, I read to him from the Philokalia that although we ought to say the Jesus prayer at all times, it is especially needful to do so with the utmost care when we are preparing for communion. So he did. 
and then he made his confession and communion. Although from time to time the old thoughts still came over him, yet he easily drove them away with the Jesus prayer. On Sunday, so as to be up for matins more easily, he went to bed earlier and went on saying the Jesus prayer. I still sat in the corner and read my Philokalia by a rushlight. You know, this is beautiful. <laughs> this, this is really a wonderful description of two people really just, the earnestness here is so touching. You know, they're on retreat together is what they're doing. And they're deciding to not talk to each other, not to waste any time, but to sit there and keep each other's minds. I mean, this is true holy company, both of them urging and encouraging each other to practice and both of them experiencing the joy of it, experiencing the relief and the freedom in it. And, uh, you know, what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful idea, even, when you're together with someone who's a practitioner or, or a lover of the divine. You know, if you go out together and maybe encourage each other to do this sometime. Yeah, let's go out. To, let's go for a nice hike. And let's not say a word to each other. Let's just do our japam the entire time. You know, and when we stop for a snack, maybe read something together or something. Anyway, it's, it's, <laughs> I love this. This is really, really a great thing. And the fact that one of them was in such a deep state of need and has so easily glummed on to these instructions, it really speaks to the life of our, of our uh, pilgrim, which you can see he has no judgment. You know, he didn't berate the guy for, for praying to God on his way to do a robbery. <laughs> He even used it. He says, see, if you were going down your robbery and you were chanting the name of God and he didn't strike you dead at that point, how much more so is he not going to, you know, punish you if in a sense, in a, in a frame mindset of repentance, of renunciation and discernment, how much more uh, is he going to give to you than that? I still sat in the corner and read my Philokalia by a rushlight. An hour went past. He fell asleep, and I set myself to prayer. All of a sudden, about 20 minutes later, he gave a start and woke up, jumped quickly out of bed, and ran over to me in tears. And speaking with the greatest happiness, he said, Oh, brother, what I have just seen. How peaceful and happy I am. I believe that God has had mercy upon all sinners and does not torment them. Glory to you, O Lord glory to you. I was surprised and glad and asked him to tell me exactly what had happened to him. Why this, he said, directly I fell asleep. I saw myself in that meadow where they tortured me. At first I was terrified, but I saw that instead of a cloud, the bright sun was shining and a wonderful light shining over the whole meadow. And I saw red flowers and grass in it. Then suddenly my grandfather came up to me, looking nicer than you ever saw. And he greeted me gently and kindly. And he said, go to Zitomir, to the church of St. George. They will take you under church protection. Send the rest of, spend the rest of your life there and pray without ceasing. God will be gracious to you. When he said this, he made the sign of the cross over me and straight away vanished. I can't tell you, I can't tell you how happy I felt. It was as though a load had been taken off my shoulders, as if I had been flown away to heaven. And, to, and that, at that point, I woke up feeling, feeling easy in my mind and my heart so full of joy that I didn't know what to do. What ought, to, what ought I to do now? I shall start straight away for Zitomir, as my grandfather told me. I shall find it easy going with the prayer. But wait a minute, dear brother. How can you start off in the middle of the night? Stay for matins, say your prayers, and then start off with God. You know, what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful reassurance experience. I, I, you know, I've talked to several people that have had that kind of experience. And really, when you're when you are really at the beginning, you know, stepping out of the world, even the slightest touch by the divine is overwhelming. It just seems so amazing. And this 
to know, know through experience, to know through experience the depth of the grace of the beloved, to, to be able to, to leave an entire life behind. <laughs> With such a reassurance and such a promise and such a potential and a possibility, what a delight, I mean, what a beautiful thing this is that we're talking about and how the divine delivers if the, if the prayer is sincere and earnest, you know. If the prayer is, to, is to sincere and earnest, uh, you can test these things. God will rise to the occasion. A Brahmananda promises it. You know, do your practice. Do your practice. Do your practice. You know, and do it with great as much love as you can muster in there. So we didn't go to sleep after this conversation. We went to church. He stayed all through mountains, praying earnestly with tears. And he said that he felt very peaceful and glad, and that the Jesus prayer was going on happily. Then after the liturgy, he made his communion. And when we had some food, I went with him as far as the Zitomir Road, where we said goodbye with tears of gladness in our eyes. Absolutely beautiful. After this... I began to think about my own affairs. Where should I go now? In the end, I decided that I would go back again to Kiev. The wise teaching of my priest there drew me that way. And besides, if I stayed with him, he might find some Christ-loving philanthropist who would give me, who would put me on my way to Jerusalem, or at least to Mount Athos. So I stopped another week at Pokchev. You know, it's just, it's, it's so interesting to see how he's really in the moment and on his pilgrimage. You know, he never has a set plan. He's very flexible. And each person that he meets leads him in a different direction and where he gets all the things that he needs. You know, mother is just continually teaching him here as he goes along. And this is that dance that we talk about with the divine. You know, not making big plans for our life or when you are making your plans to make sure in your mind that God is present and that every plan that you make is presented to the Lord for with, with the flexibility of change, you know, saying, this is the, this is the plan as I see it. And as I understand it, bless it or change it, just let me know. And there's such a confidence, uh, you know, inside that comes forward in living like that, uh, you know, I'm feeling a little bit of shame because of my doubt that I feel sometimes, you know, like, <laughs> you know, even though mother's so kind day after day after day, there's a part of the mind that's just like, well, I better hedge my bets here. You know, maybe it will, maybe we'll do it this way or that way. And so, you know, if you can find the courage uh, to live bravely, you know, without a plan, really surrender to the divine and, uh, you know, living like this pilgrim, uh, everyone that was helped by him, he was so deeply helped by them. You know, this is the way the, that spiritual life works. It's never one way. If a Swami is scolding you, you can know that mother is using you to teach him as well. This is the way the universe works. Everybody is for everybody's good. Even the horrible things that happen uh, with effort with effort and grace uh, can be plumbed for their advantage. You know, that there is something to be learned from everything. Uh, in, in every moment, making gold is possible uh, if you insist on it, if you don't let it defeat you. you know, if you hold on to St. Paul says in Romans 8 28, maybe, that's a long time ago. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those that love God or are not called according to his purpose. So there's a promise. So I stopped another week at Pokejo, spending the time in recalling all that I had learned from those who I, that I had met on this journey and in making notes of a number of helpful things. Then I got ready for the journey. I put on my kotomka and went to a church to commend my journey to the mother of God. 
When the liturgy was over, I said my prayers and was ready to start. I was standing at the back of the church when a man came in, not very richly dressed, but clearly one of the gentry. And he asked me where the candles were sold. I showed him. At the end of the liturgy, I stayed praying at the shrine of the footprint. When I had finished my prayers, I set off on my way. I had gone a little way along the street when I saw an open window in one of the houses at which a man was reading a book. My way took me past that very window, and I saw that the man sitting there was the same one who had asked me about the candles in church. As I went by, I took off my hat, and when he saw me, he beckoned me to come to him and said, I suppose you must be a pilgrim. Yes, I answered. He asked me in and wanted to know who I was and where I was going. I told him all about myself and hid nothing. He gave me some tea and began to talk to me. You know, this, this is kind of a wonderful thing. It brings to mind, you know, I lived in San Francisco for 27 years. And uh, I guess what 15 of those years was what had nothing to do with Vedanta <laughs> at all. <laughs> And I can remember walking up the Fillmore Hill past the Vedanta Society. And if you haven't been there, uh, the Vedanta Society in San Francisco is one block uh, north of what's called Billionaire's Row, you know, uh, on Broadway, where all the biggest mansions are, the richest people. And uh, it's, it's an, an incredibly beautiful part of town. And the monastery is on an incredibly beautiful piece of property that has full view of the whole bay and i remember walking by that place and having no idea what it was but they were building an addition I, I know now that that addition was the new library and the uh the fellowship hall the extension that they built and they were building and i remember it just to give you a window into my mind at that time i remember looking at it and i saw the name swami vivekananda and i thought oh god one of those cults from from the east and i walked by and i thought dang they must, they must have a lot of money to be building in this neighborhood. You know, <laughs> and that was, that was my only thought. I had no association with the place. If you had stopped me on that street at that day and said, you know, within five years, you'll be living here. <laughs> you'll be a monk in there. I, I don't know. I, 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 I couldn't even have imagined, even up till five days before I joined the monastery, uh, if I had made a list of the top 100 things that my lot that I would end up doing in my life, becoming a Hindu monk was maybe number 563. I, I it was like, I never got there. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and then within a couple of years, uh, boom, there I was living in that building and uh, worshiping along with all my other cult members. <laughs> <laughs> the divine, the divine name, but learning that it was the opposite of a cult, that it opened my mind and widened my mind farther than I imagined possible, filled my life with so much beauty, so much challenge. Oof. I tell you, there were a good number of years in there that were, wow. But the funny thing is, is that you don't know, you know, you walk by something, you walk, you meet people every day. You talk to people every day. You walk by buildings every day. And I find it amazingly interesting that even though things may have nothing to do with you now, at some point, that person that you noticed or that building that you passed could become pivotal to your life. You know, this is the, the potential when love is in the air, <laughs> when God is being acknowledged, when the mind is being set right. Uh, the whole world the whole universe conspires to your realization and the lessons fall from the trees, you know, seep out onto the sidewalks everywhere that you are. And if you walk with eyes to see, that's why Jesus used to always begin every one of his uh, uh, parables. He who has the ears to hear, let him hear, or he who has the eyes to see, let him see. The person who has the ears or the eyes is the person that's turning those ears and eyes toward the divine, you know, repeating the divine name, the prayer within, living their day in an awareness of the presence. And God can teach you with everything. 
And it's quite fun that you can walk along and you can pick up a leaf and communicate with God for a moment about it. Pick it up and look at it and turn to mother and say, teach me something from this leaf. And then be quiet. And I guarantee you, I promise you, that within just a very few moments, you'll get an inspiring idea based on that leaf. You'll get some instruction because this universe is God. Everything that you see is your beloved. And if you begin to treat it that way, begin to understand it and see it that way, it dances and it teaches at every turn and gives comfort, gives companionship, gives hope, gives freshness and newness. This is divine life. This is learning how to live. He gave me some tea and began to talk to me. Listen, my little pigeon. <laughs> I would have run out at that point, I think. <laughs> Listen, my little pigeon, I should advise you to go to the Solovetsky footnote, the famous monastery on the group of islands of that name in the White Sea. It was founded in, seven, in 1429 by St. German and St. Sabas. The former had been a monk of Valam. So listen, my little pigeon, I should advise you to go to the Sol Solovetsky monastery. There is a very secluded and peaceful skeet there. A very secluded and peaceful skeet. And a skeet is a small monastic community dependent upon a large monastery. <coughs> so there is a peaceful skeet there called Azersky or Anzersky. It is like a second Athos and they welcome everybody there. The novitiate consists only in this, that they take turns to read the Psalter in church four hours out of every 24. I'm going there myself, and I have taken a vow to go on foot. We might go together. I should be safer with you. They say it is a very lonely road. On the other hand, I have got money, and I could supply you with food the whole way. And I should propose we went on these terms that we walked half a dozen yards apart when we should not be in each other's way. And as we went, we would spend the time in reading all the while or in meditation. Think it over, brother, and do agree. It will be worth your while. <clears throat> so you see, God was cooking up something just as this young pilgrim was showing this man where the, where the candles were. When I heard this invitation, I took this unexpected event as a sign for my journey from the mother of God, whom I had asked to teach me the way of blessedness. And without further thought, I agreed at once. And so we set out the next day. We walked for three days as we had agreed, one behind the other. He read a book the whole time, a book which never left his hand day or night. And at times he was meditating about something. At last, we came to a halt at a certain place for dinner. He ate his food with the book lying open in front of him, and he was continually looking at it. I saw that the book was a copy of the Gospels, and I said to him, May I venture to ask, sir, why you never allow the Gospels out of your hand day or night? Why you always hold it and carry it with you? Because, he answered, from it and it alone, I am almost continually learning and what are you learning i went on the christian life which is summed up in prayer i consider that prayer is the most important and necessary means of salvation and the first duty of every christian prayer is the first step in the devout life and also its crown and that is why the gospel bids unceasing prayer. To other acts of piety, their own times are assigned. But in the matter of prayer, there are no off times. You see? <laughs> There's the good news. There is no end to your practice. <laughs> you are repeating the name of God. There is no off time. It's the one thing that the mother allows and encourages 
all the time, any time, any place, no exceptions, and that it is always valuable. You will always find comfort in it. You know, so if, 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 the, if any of those times come, times of fear, times of loneliness, times of depression, times of uns unsureness, you know, in all of those times, the, the prayer uh, is your refuge. The prayer and the divine are the same. There's no difference. If you repeat your mantra, the presence of God is there. And uh, the prayer will bring your mind to it, bring you bring you before the beloved. And the more earnest and sincere, the quicker and deeper the, that sense of peace and bliss will be. Without prayer, it is impossible to do any good. And without the gospel, you cannot learn properly about prayer. Therefore, all those who have reached salvation by way of the interior life, the holy preachers of the word of God, as well as hermits and recluses, and indeed all God-fearing Christians, were taught by their unfailing and constant occupation with the depths of God's word by reading the gospel. Many of them had the gospel constantly in their hands, and in their teaching about salvation gave the advice, sit down in the silence of your cell and read the gospel and read it again. There you have the reason why I concern myself with the gospel alone. That's very similar to Vivekananda, who always carried with him two books, the gospel, or not the, not the gospel, two books, the Gita and uh, the Imitation of Christ, that he carried those two books with him all the time. And so uh, pick your book, <laughs> pick your book and carry it with you always. Uh, you know, really good ones are these little tiny ones that like the ones that I started when we were teaching on Sri Sharda Devi, you know, those little books, the life and teachings of Sri Sharda Devi, or they brought one on Ramakrishna, and Vivekananda, uh, or thus the Thus Spake series, those little tiny books, only like three inches high or something. Every Vedanta bookstore sells them. And it's just the main, just kind of a collection of the main teachings of all the great sages. They have the all the world's traditions in there. Uh, and it's quite wonderful to have one of those with you and just to read and, and give you a seed for meditation or contemplation if you're on a bus or if you're flying somewhere or something like that. But it's interesting that here, this holy man is carrying a book always and our holy man, Vivek. Vivekananda did the same. I was very much pleased with this reasoning of his and with his eagerness for prayer. I went on to ask him from which gospel in particular he got the teaching about prayer. From all four of the evangelists, he answered, in a word from the whole of the New Testament, reading it in order. I have been reading it for a long time and taking in the meaning and it has shown me that there is a graduation and a regular chain of teaching about prayer in the Holy Gospel, beginning from the verse, first evangelist, which was Matthew, and going right through in a regular order in a system. For instance, at the very beginning, there is laid down the approach or the introduction to teaching about prayer, then the form of the outward expression of it in words, Farther on, we have the necessary conditions upon which prayer may be offered, the means of learning it, and examples. And finally, the secret teaching about interior and spiritual ceaseless prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, which is set forth as higher and more salutary than formal prayer. And then comes its necessity, its blessed fruit, and so on. In a word, there is to be found in the gospel full and detailed knowledge about the practice of prayer in systematic order or sequence from beginning to end. When I heard this, I decided to ask him to show me all this in detail. So I said, as I like hearing and talking about prayer more than anything else, I should be very glad indeed to see this secret chain of teaching about prayer in all its detail. For the love of God then, Show me all this in the gospel itself. He readily agreed to this and said, Open your gospel, look at it, and make notes about what I say. And he gave me a pencil. Be so good as to look at these notes of mine. Now, said he, look out first of all in the gospel of St. Matthew, 
the sixth chapter, and read from the fifth to the ninth verses. You see that here we have the preparation or the introduction. Does someone have a Bible in arm's view or arm's length? There we go. Nicole does one. Nicole, you want to look up Matthew 6, 5 through 9? You have to run and get it? Okay, no worries. We'll go through and look these things up with them. I, I, I might have a Bible behind me, actually. <laughs> Don't tell her. I put a link in there. What's that? Uh, I put a link in there. Oh, okay. All right. Nicole's going to read for us. Matthew 6, verses 5 to 9. We'll see how fast she is in finding the book of Matthew. If I go into Samadhi, it's your fault. Matthew 6, <laughs> 5 through 9? Matthew okay. 6, no, 5, 5 through 9. 5 through 9. Okay. So we have, okay, so this is the, it doesn't matter the translation. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. Wait, you said five through nine. Six, yes. five through nine. I yes. also have, a, okay, six, five. That was a good teaching too, though. In relation to anxiety? That's I don't know. Matthew, Matthew, I'll take that one. That model six, prayer. It's a model prayer. Right? Six. I I have it if you want. If you okay, in relation to prayer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're five yeah. through. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless reputation, repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And then we go to the Lord's Prayer. Pray then in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then leave, not lead us in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I went past that, but I couldn't pass up the Lord's Prayer. So. Right. Beautiful. All right. That's wonderful. There's a couple of things in there. Just that, that whole idea of opening the whole mind to the Lord. The God is already aware, already aware of everything. He's mm -hmm. living your life through you, actually. It's you who has given him a different name or her a different name. And so that intimacy develops by this practice, by as we grow in that understanding, you know, and, and that it's not about many words. Sometimes it's about no words. Sometimes it's just about being open, being vulnerable in the presence, uh, letting everything come out, let everything, letting God see everything consciously, you know, in your own, in your own action. And to open to that love and to that grace to that mercy and let let yourself be changed by it transcended <clears throat> so read from the fifth to the ninth verses you see here we have the preparation or the introduction teaching that not for vain glory and noisily but in a solitary place and in quietude we should begin our prayer and pray only for the forgiveness of sin and for communion with god and not devising many and unnecessary repetitions about various worldly things, as the heathen do. Then read further on in the same chapter, from the ninth to the fourteenth verses. Here, the form of prayer is given to us. That is to say, in what sort of words it ought to be expressed. There you have brought together in great wisdom everything that is necessary and desirable in our life. For that, go on and read the 14th and 15th verses of the same chapter. Are you there? Priya, are you there already? 
Nope. Yeah. I am. You want to read it? Yeah, 14 uh, 15. Yeah. For, I'm, if, not, I'm not firing you, Cookie. No. <laughs> for, just if, mm -hmm. for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Mm. All right. Let's, I'm going to read what he has to say first, and then if, it, if we're of anything different, we'll talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. 14th and 15th verses of the same chapter, and you will see the conditions that are necessary to observe so that the prayer may be effective. For unless we forgive those who have injured us, God will not forgive our sins. Pass on, pass on now to the seventh chapter. Okay, so we'll get there in a second. Kuki, this one's going to be yours. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so this, there's a very important point here that prayer and honesty are one and the same, you know, and this is where we come to truth as one of the most important things. So when you're sitting there praying for things for yourself, be very honest in your approach, be very open and be aware of whether you have given those very same things to others, you know, check it's a time for in the light of the divine always to, to reckon your life to reckon your day, to reckon the way that you're living uh, and, and to really sit in that truth. Uh, it's the embarrassment and the pain of confession that helps us to change, you know, and it's the growing awareness of the intimacy of God that, that lets us do it with success, right? So when you pray, it's a, rec a time of reckoning for you also, a time of consideration, do you see how I trust God to give me these things? Am I trustworthy to the world to be asked the same things of me? You know, because we are that. So pass on now to the seventh chapter, and you will find in the seventh to the twelfth verses how to succeed in prayer. So verses seven to twelve. Nicole or Cookie. Soul sister. Hey. Oh, yeah. seven, then seven. Yeah, we're in prayer in chapters seven, verses this seven is, to 12. Yeah, this is just a very confusing Bible. There's like five in this house. I grabbed the most confusing one. <laughs> Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? That was seven through nine, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, seven to 12. Can you go to what's the Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Or, okay. Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Mm. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law of the prophets. Yes. All right. So it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, it's saying that the mood of prayer is love, right? And so set yourself in the mood of love when you pray. And that mood of love is enhanced by the faith in God's love. You know, that God is, if you can imagine pure love without condition, which is something very lofty and very difficult for us to understand, much less actually have faith in. But if you can sit and contemplate that, you know, and to know that that is the atmosphere of your prayer, that is the company and the companionship of the divine then you consider carefully and deeply what you ask, you know, with a faith, knowing that God gives you the right thing, that, that, that prayers don't have to be born of fear and, and repentance and scariness at all. That prayer is, is, is enveloped in a very deep and pure love. And that that time with the divine is fearless and encouraging and hopeful and that he, she will give to you what's best for you and will bring you home in the end. So that deep confidence 
you know this is this is where our uh, self worth comes from. This is where our uh, confidence comes from. Is from this deep and abiding knowledge of the nature of the universe being this unconditioned love, and that's where we find our 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 strength to keep going, our strength to to absorb the wrongdoing around us, the injustices that happen to us, you know, the slights that, that occur during the day. This is where we find our peace. And this is what builds our character is knowing uh, a faith of believing in those words, in the nature of this prayer. <clears throat> Pass on now to the seventh chapter and you'll find in the seventh to the 12th verses, how to succeed in prayer, to be bold in hope, ask, seek, knock. These strong expressions depict, depict frequency in prayer and the urgency of practicing it so that prayer shall not only accompany all actions, but even come before them in time. This constitutes the principal property of prayer. You will see an example of this in the 14th chapter of St. Mark and the 32nd to the 40th verses. You want to get that for us, Priya? The book of Mark. It's the second gospel in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. It's the shortest gospel, and it's the, the 14th chapter, 14, 32 to 40. You're muted. Okay. Oh, there, you go. there you go. Prayer in the garden. So 32 until when? 32 to 40. 40. Then they came to a place which was named, I might butcher this, Get, 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 get Semini. Get Semini. Okay. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. Then the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, the betrayer is at hand. That's the end of 42. Yeah. Wow, so that's the prayer in Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a is a private garden that Jesus quite often would re, would retire to for prayer with his disciples, and this is the last prayer of Jesus, the last prayer on earth, you know, <clears throat> where he now goes out and and Judas greets him as he comes out from praying in the garden. Judas greets him and kisses him on the cheek to identify him as the Christ, and he gets arrested, and then. You know, within days he's crucified. And so he was asking God, just laying out, pouring out his heart. I mean, if there's any way for this cup to be taken from me, I think like if, if I don't have to do this, please don't make me do it. But if, if there's no other way, I surrender. No, your will be done, not my will. And so it's a real surrendering in prayer to the will of the divine. Uh, and it's a depth of feeling in a prayer, a depth of sincerity, right? 
and the, it's the prayer of the Christ, and you see that 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 intensity, and of course, kind of almost in a comic relief, you see <laughs> you see the common person like you and me, you know, out there falling asleep in every opportunity <laughs> during our prayer, but it's the ideal. So he says, where Jesus Christ himself repeats the same words of prayer frequently. Saint, Saint Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's the next gospel. This is for you, Kuki. Oh, shit. Mm, that's a start. Oh, I'm <laughs> naked. I'm so. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm in tears. Luke, where? Chapter uh, Luke 11. Yeah. You're doing good. You're doing good. Um, oh, Lord. Luke, Luke 11. 11, 5 to 14. Okay. Ooh, not, and this will be our last one. It's not as easy as Swami makes it seem when he reads. <laughs> Without them. Yep. The, yep. the yeah. Lord's heart weeping. Okay. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs you said through nine uh five to fourteen fourteen oh god so i say to you ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened now suppose one of you Fathers is asked by his son for a fish. Will he not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Hmm. And he was casting out a demon. They said 19. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all right. And he was casting out a demon and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. But he who there knew their thoughts said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself fails. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that it cast, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do you son, do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. So 19. Okay. Very good. Yeah, so there are a bunch of promises there. That prayer is <clears throat> not trivial. You know, and that it's it's well i mean it's deeply connected to your sincerity and your earnestness as far as its efficacious its effectiveness you know but god's reassuring you there you know ask you will receive knock the door will be opened seek you will find so there's no failure for us there's no failure for us. Prayer, prayer is quintessentially important, you know, toward the divine. Just this constant remembrance, living in the presence. That's what unceasing prayer is. You see, unceasing, everything that you say, think, or do in a day is a prayer. To become aware of that is to pray without ceasing. And so if you can get this single-mindedness to the way that you live your life, to where everything is a prayer and you recognize that, then you begin to live in a very particular way. You become single-minded in your reaction, in your actions with the world, with this divine manifestation. 
you know. And so if you can stay in that consciousness, stay in that awareness, ask, it'll be given. Knock, it will be opened. Seek, you will find. So these are promises over and over and over again. It's up to you to trust them, to test them, to plumb their depths, and to find what you're looking for. All right.